thank you so much um, for the for inviting me. It's such a privilege, such an honor to be here with you guys today. And um, I don't know about you, but there's just such a sweetness of God's presence in this place, and really, really um, have a deep sense. Like even while we were worshiping, um, we mentioned living waters flowing like a river. That's something I I I saw when we were praying beforehand. Just a river of God flowing in and through your lives. And God is doing something incredible in this place. And um, there's a lovely scripture. I'm going to pray. Don't worry. Uh, we're going to pray. But uh, there's a lovely scripture um, in the book of John 4 when Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman. And you guys know how it goes, I think. Hopefully. You guys all know, right? And uh, at the end, he starts talking about worship and says the true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. And just after that, she goes into the, back into the Samaritan village to tell people, hey, this is the guy who told me everything about my life. And this could be the, this is the Messiah we've been waiting for. Jesus preaches in the same village overnight. And the people come back to the Samaritan lady, and this is what they say. They say, now we believe, not just because you told us, but because we have heard him for ourselves. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for every single person in this place. Thank you that you are here, you are moving. Thank you, Lord, that where two or three are gathered, there you are, Lord. There you command your blessing, God. So I just thank you, Lord, that as we hear your word today, let it not be me who speaks, but you that speaks through me. I pray you would prepare our hearts to receive from you, Lord, that you would speak like never before, God. And we just pray, Lord, that um, you would anoint us all to receive because we know we cannot do anything that is of eternal glory without your anointing. So thank you, Holy Spirit. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, like I said before, it's such an amazing privilege and honor to be with you guys today. And I just want to share something God's been doing uh, over my life in the last couple of weeks. And um, just been in the book of John, as we've all been speaking about the book of John. And, you know, everybody's been on about the book of John today. So uh, uh, God's got his hand on it. And so we're going to, we're going to, we're going to speak from there or learn from there today. Um, in John 6, verse 23 to 29, um, reading from the NLT. And this is just after Jesus has fed the 20,000 people, blessed the five loaves and the two fish and multiplied um, and the disciples distributed among the people. One of the greatest miracles, actually one of the, they wanted to make, they wanted to crown Jesus as king in that moment, but he slipped away to be in the hills with his father. And, um, and you know the story, the disciples go across to the other side of the lake uh, because they didn't know where Jesus was. And Jesus soon followed on by walking on the water and um, ends up catching up with him along the way. And they all end up on the other side. And this is what happened. So several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. They found him on the other side of the lake, and this is what the people asked. Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Jesus was very savage here, I must say. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to... <laughs> you want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous sign. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, we want to perform God's works too. So what should we do? And then Jesus told them, this is the only work God requires and God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Believe in the one he has sent. Something very, something I really love about this passage of scripture is when, is how the people saw the provision and not the provider. They saw the miraculous sign. They didn't see the God who was providing this miraculous sign for them to eat and to see his glory. We must be careful that our faith isn't reduced to only what we can receive from God but his righteous character and who he is and knowing who he is and making him known in the world around us. Amen. Amen. So our faith should be centered on the cross resurrection and an intimate conversational relationship 
with Jesus. So number one, simple faith is about intimacy. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about simple faith. Simple faith is about intimacy. So when I first came to knowing Christ um, and, uh, you know, being serious about him as a Christian my whole life, but when I started becoming serious about God, it was about the age of 11. I was baptized in an alpha camp in Tio Strand and the Holy Spirit, I encountered the Holy Spirit like never before and just dreams and visions and, you know, God just moving in my life in that season. And um, I remember, you know, listening to all of the seasoned veterans in the faith and when they would pray, Thou, O Lord, art God. And I was like, Thou and art and Thee and on. It's beautiful. I love it. It's amazing. But uh, because they were so seasoned and I saw them moving in God and I was so passionate, I was like, let me try praying like they pray. I was like, to no avail. Because I was like, O Lord, Thou, Thee art. O my God. <laughs> I was like, yes, I got it. Nailed it. But actually... Uh, you know, that's okay because that was their relationship with God. But in my naivety, I copied them thinking it was going to make me more spiritual, right? But true spirituality is being able to have a conversational relationship with God. Can you speak to him about the intricacies of your heart? Do you know the intricacies of his heart? Knowing him, speaking to him as one would a friend. It all comes back to intimacy. The reason we are in this place, intimacy. The reason we set the chairs like this for church, so people can grow in intimacy with God. The reason we worship, to be intimate with our Father. It all comes back to intimacy. Um, I remember in one of my first years, or probably was, yes, it was my first year of Bible college in 2018, and I remember sitting outside the church and just had this vision of the whole church dissipating, like, not the, the actual church, the people, meaning like the building. And it was all like just dust on the ground. I remember God saying to me so clearly, would you still serve me if this didn't exist? Would you still have a relationship with me? Would you still have intimacy with me if it wasn't for this building? Matthew 7 verse 21 to 23 is one of the most scary scriptures. And every time I read it, just the fear of God is just on the scripture. And you guys uh, probably know it, but it says this. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. You, ish, is a hectic one. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. The word, the, the word no in the Hebrew that Jesus was talking about is the word yada. Now, yada is this, is to be acquainted with and to know by experience. In other words, intimacy. Intimacy. God, please help me. I'd rather God knows who I am first rather than what I can do for him. God, do you know the intricacies of my heart? Do I know the intricacies of yours? Intimacy. Why did Jesus say, you who break God's laws? Because what is the greatest commandment? Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So what does this commandment bring us back to? Intimacy. You break God's laws and all the laws are summed up in that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's intimacy. They replied to Jesus, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? And Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. There are so many religions that leave people feeling unsure or, or confused in their pursuit of who God is. Maybe the gods are for us. Maybe they're against us. But Jesus tells us exactly what he desires from our lives because our God, Yahweh, is a God of clarity. He doesn't operate in confusion. We always know his intention, even from the beginning. 
this is what you were created for. This is my plan for your life. There is never confusion when it comes to Yahweh. He is always clear about what he desires from us. And so Jesus says, this is the only work God requires from you, to believe in the one he has sent, to have faith. Satisfying God does not come from the work we do, but whom we believe in our faith. This, the first step is accepting that Jesus is who he claims to be. All spiritual development is built on this foundation. I believe that Jesus died for me on the cross. I believe he was raised to life in resurrection power. And that's where I live from today. Amen. It's not just about believing that God is real. It's what do you believe about him? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's not just, I can believe, I can believe that God is real. I can believe that he's out to get me. He's out to, you know, hammer me for all of the things I've done wrong. That's still faith. But it's, faith is about what do I believe about God? And how do I know what I believe about God? I go back to his word. I hear his word and I read his word. Point number two is that simple faith is all about eternity. Don't be con so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. Our faith grows when it is connected to eternity. We have faith that Jesus died on the cross for us. We have faith that he was raised to life and power. But we must also have faith that he's coming back one day. A lot of the times we find ourselves in our faith, you know, sometimes our faith is dry and sometimes our faith is high. But one thing I know, your faith will continue to grow if your faith is connected to eternity. We must connect the two places of faith. At the foot of the cross, the resurrection power of God and eternity one day with him. We are encouraged to live each day like Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming back. Since, since the day he left, he's coming back. And that's how we're going to live. <laughs> Paul has been talking about it. We're talking about it today. He's coming back. He's on his way. He's right here. He's knocking on the door of our hearts. And that's how we ought to live each day like he's coming back soon. Hebrews 11 verse 13 to 16 says this. All these people died. Speaking about the, the people of our faith, the apostles that went before us or in fact, it wasn't the apostles in this particular scripture, but all the people who went before us who did amazing things for God, who lived by faith. It says, all these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and they welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads on the earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they would have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why, I love this part. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Their eyes were on eternity. Not on what they could build for themselves right now. Their eyes were on eternity. Their eyes were fixed on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of their faith. And that is why they could run with endurance. All of these people abandoned their earth, earthly lives to pursue the heavenly kingdom. Every follower of Christ must ask the question, what am I holding on to that's preventing me from carrying my cross? What am I holding on to today that I need to surrender before him, that I need to lay down before the foot of the cross? What am I holding on to that's stopping me from pursuing the kingdom with all of my heart? with all of my soul, with all of my strength. Then Jesus, in Matthew 16, verse 24 to 25, says this to his disciples. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Now we must remember in those days, the cross wasn't like how we see it today. You know, we're like, ah, oh, it's our savior. He died on the cross. For them, they saw people dying, being tortured every day on that instrument of death. So when Jesus said, pick up your cross, they were like, this guy is crazy. 
because I'm seeing people being, being put on that thing and dying brutal deaths. This is what Jesus points us to. In order for us to have unpolluted faith, he points us to an instrument of death that I must die to self so that I can reign in Christ. Oh. You see, when Jesus says, it only takes the faith of the size of a mustard seed to move a mountain. It's not talking about 99% doubt and 1% faith. It's talking about 100% of this much faith can move a mountain. We've got to kick unbelief out of the door today. Because that's the only way we can die to self. Faith and reasoning always equals more doubt. But faith and obedience equals miracles. The more I try to reason myself, why this? Why is this happening? Why is all of these bad things happening? What well, My faith starts to dampen. But the moment I attach faith and obedience, whew, miracles begin to flow from my life like a river. For the Israelites, oh, we already, we already went there. But number three is how do faith and suffering work together? This is a very, this is a question that a lot of uh, people, you know, get, get stuck on in life. You know, when we come to faith, we think everything's going to be all right. You know, everything's going to be nice and smooth and rosy. In fact, if somebody can teach me how to carry my cross better, I will listen to you every day. Because carrying a cross can sometimes get heavy, guys. That's the truth. It sometimes can get heavy. It can get ridiculed in the world if you're living Rightly for God. I think sometimes we blend in a little bit too much. I'm guilty of it. But carrying the cross is not an easy thing. So how do faith and suffering work together? It's a beautiful story in John 9, verse 1 to 3. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Jesus replies, it was not because of his parents' sins or his sins. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. Now in Jewish custom, or even some of us, we, we believe today that a lot of the calamity and a lot of the evil that happens in our lives is because of great sin. But what does Jesus say? So that the power of God can be seen in you on this day. You see how reasoning can sometimes bring doubt into our lives when we try to reason, why, why did this trouble happen? Why am I going through this financial distress? Why is this person sick? They live for Christ their whole lives. Jesus says about this man who had been born blind, not because of his parents' sins or even his sins, but so that the power of God can be seen in him. In this life, we will not understand everything that happens. Good behavior isn't always rewarded. Bad behavior isn't always punished. So sometimes the innocent suffer. You know, I've, I've met a lot of teenagers who just, you know, we just, we, we've all done this. We've all blamed God for some of the evil that's gone down in our lives because of sometimes what we believe about his sovereignty. But blaming God about every bad thing that happens it's like blaming the minister of transport for all of the accidents on the road. Each time it would be point back, pointed back to negligence, right? God has given us this great gift. He's given us his anointing. He's given us his Holy Spirit. I was so convicted the other day because I just remembered like, cheapers. we're carrying the mantle of the apostles. We're carrying the mantle of Elijah and all of these great people that have gone before us. They, a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, cheering us on in the faith. What are they going to say of us that we did with the mantle they carried? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Read in the book of Acts about all these crazy things. Paul's busy sitting on the boats. All the guys are panicking they're going to die. Paul's like, ah, we're going to be good. Don't worry. All the, he's busy, you know, just chilling. He's relaxed. He's like, guys, just, just relax, just eat. God told me we're going to be okay. All of these crazy things happening in, in the book of Acts. And we're like, oh, guys, the, the prophets 
And the people in the, in the Old Testament, they look forward to what we have today. They were looking at, towards the day the Holy Spirit would dwell within us. And they, they were like, they were pumped. This is what they said. They died still believing what God had promised. And we get to live in that promise. What are we doing with that promise today? This is, a, this is my challenge, even to myself. God, what are we doing with this promise that you've given us? What are we doing with this gift? Are we sidelining the Holy Spirit in our daily lives? Are we letting him take the lead? Are we letting him go before us? Are we adopting the attitude of Moses when he said, God, we will not go where your presence is not. God says, I've given you the land. Take it. It's yours. It's beautiful. It's flowing. Milk and honey, all of these amazing things. Go, I'm going to send my angel before you. He's going to drive out all the evil people. Then you can go and settle in the land. Moses says, God, we're not going anywhere without you. You've brought us this far. And one thing that makes us different is that we're marked by your presence. So we will not go unless you go before us. We need to take a stand, guys, especially in today's day where, where the world is in calamity. But let me tell you something. God has saved his best soldiers for lost. If you're sitting in a seat here today, it's because God has put his best militia on the earth for this hour. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to plunder hell. We're going to populate heaven. And we've got to be ruthless about it. Because the Bible says from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and the violent take it by force. Other versions say passionate, just in case you were worried, go around, you know, hitting people. Well, oh yeah, that was already done by Smith. So uh, <laughs> uh, he took it quite literally, the violent take it by force. But that's what we ought to do, guys. Take it by force. Trust God. If there's something in your life that doesn't match up or line up with God's word, as a child of God, you have every right to say, God, your word says this. My life is not lining up with this. So let's bring the two together. I think sometimes we get so used to living in suffering or we get so used to living a certain way that we stop having sorrow over it and we stop trusting God to deliver us from it and we stop having faith that he's gonna carry us through because we're so used to living. I remember in 2020, I was like, I was like, I was down and out because I'm a social person by nature. So I was just sitting at home and I was like, God, I need to see people because I'm as church man I'm struggling here like I'm in lockdown and all these bad things and 2021 came and I was like oh god another one no please we can't do this again but that's the attitude we've adopted sometimes in our lives is that because we've gone through the same thing over and over and over and over again that we stop having faith we stop believing that God can break us through we gotta believe and keep on believing and stand firm and fight the good fight. He's coming soon. And when he comes, it's all coming back to intimacy. It will just be us and him. Not the things we've built, the lies we've built for ourselves, the money in our bank accounts, the families, you know, the, the, you know all these amazing things that we, we, uh, we aspire to in this life. But when it comes to that day, when we see him face to face, it's going to be just... Him and me, and that's all that matters. And I want him to say that he knew me, and that I loved him, and that he loved me, that I didn't do, you know, about something about funerals is that the, you know, people, they, they never ever talk about how, what, how many cars this person had. Oh, you know, they, they drove this kind of Land Rover with this kind of engine or this, you know, they never ever say that at a funeral. But what they remember is how the character of that person, how that person made them feel. And those, those are the things that are priceless in this life. And those are the things we will pursue with all of our hearts because of Jesus within us. So imagine if we embraced this attitude when faced with adversity, no matter what you may be facing today, no matter what you may see going wrong in your life or going right in your life and all of these things. Every kind of suffering that comes our way, God, is it because I did this? You know, when you were little and you did, and you kicked, you stubbed your toe and your mom was like, 
God's punishing you because you tuned me earlier. <laughs> you know? Like, ah, yeah, God to- God's punishing you now. <laughs> You've all experienced that, don't lie. <laughs> you know? You fall over after just disrespecting your mom, and she's like, God's punishing you. Imagine if we embrace this attitude when faced with suffering and adversity, just like, just like Jesus says of this man. Could it be that this happened so that the power of God could be seen in me this day? We've been singing the glory of the Lord. Amen. Let his glory, let his glory fill you. Let his glory be what we pursue. Let his name be the name that is above all name in our lives. The only thing that can destroy the rulership of sin is the rulership of Jesus. It's the only thing. I've tried with works. Hey, you fail very quickly and very hard. But the only thing is the rulership of Jesus. So we're going to pray. Let's pray today. Everybody close your eyes. We're going to, you don't have to close your eyes, whatever, you know, you feel. But Father, I thank you for each and every person in your house today. We thank you just for simple faith again, Lord. All of these things we've built up, Lord, all of these things we've designed and made for ourselves. God, we just, we count it all as nothing, just as Paul says. Count it all as nothing in comparison to knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior.